I'm going to say something kind of unpopular. I don't necessarily know if the government understands what an innovation strategy is. Ooh. <laughs> and yeah, I know, like, that's, that's, that's pretty explosive. Hello, and welcome to another AMA edition of the Beta Good Podcast, where we bring in a special guest to stand in front of the firing squad of your submitted questions. This month, we've got a very special guest, Ben Bergen. He's the president of the Council of Canadian Innovators. So as you might guess, oh, it's all innovation policy all the time. <laughs> so let's dig in. Ben, are you ready for um, the the hell with which we have called <laughs> upon you? Normally, like when we get submitted these questions, we're like, what kind of listenership do we have that thinks about tech and innovation in these ways? You actually court this demographic. How are, you, how are you? How are you feeling right now? <clears throat> I'm feeling good. I think you know. Normally, it's a little bit more on kind of a specific topic, and so uh, you know, like budget or you know, a specific program. So we're going to cover the waterfront, and and it's always kind of you know <laughs> fun to test your your general knowledge and and how deep and how shallow all of that is. So we should I'm price out, to it. Uh, we should price them mm-hmm. out like you know you know uh, super clusters for 400, like just to kind of <laughs> yeah. Some, oh, you know. that's a much better way of doing this. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, definitely for next month, we'll have Poncho work on a <laughs> Jeopardy, Jeopardy style board yeah. somewhere behind me. And we'll just like, I will, I will Vanna white the scenario. Okay. Yeah. But you know, uh, Ben, to your point, you know, normally we've had you on the podcast before for very specific lenses, either with a specific initiative or, Hey, it's budget time. Let's go through. I think this time mm-hmm. we were like, mm, this budget wasn't really as interesting to talk about as last year's budget, either federally or possibly even the provincial budgets. Um, And it kind of prompted the initial question that we have for you, which I think relates to why the budget was so blasé, because there wasn't much in it and there wasn't a lot of updates on things that they've been talking about for years. So let's kick this off with a heater. Um, This question came in from a variety of different ways, summarized into this. Why is the federal government so behind on so many different innovation files? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think, you know, the piece here, um, and I'm going to say something kind of unpopular, (laughs) is uh, I don't necessarily know if the government understands what an uh, innovation strategy is. Um, And (laughs) I know, like, that's that's pretty explosive. And uh, what I mean by that is, if you look at really what's happened over the last, you know, six months, is you've seen a government really focus on foreign direct investment, things like the Volkswagen uh, uh, announcement, $13 billion over 10 years, things like Ericsson, the announcement in Ottawa, things like Nokia. And so what you see is the government spending money on potentially jobs and and trying to keep jobs. Um, And so that's really a job strategy. That's not an innovation strategy. An innovation strategy is the commercialization of an idea through IP data, list kind of goes on. And so what we've seen is the government kind of focus on this sort of job strategy. And it and it feels a little bit like whiplash because, you know, we have the prime minister a couple of months ago at, a, at, at Canaxis talking about how we don't want to build a branch plant economy. And then all of the announcements that kind of follow it are branch plant uh, announcements, one after kind of another. And so you see that is kind of one of the sort of layers where the government thinks that it's doing, you know, um, solid industrial policy. And then the other is in investments in, in um, basic research, which is important, right? Like, let's not, let's not discount that. But that is uh, research that's not leading to the commercialization of IP. And we've seen the government over the last number of years make bets, whether it be things like the AI strategy, um, that ultimately haven't led to innovation. It's led to IP creation that ultimately has leaked and gone to other other jurisdictions. And so, you know, where I kind of see where are we at on the innovation file, it, the government knows how to give out money. The government knows how to do announcements. But does the government understand how to get to sort of Maslow's higher pyramid of actual innovation um, policy? And I think the question is, I don't know, uh, because we just have really seen them struggle to kind of get beyond some of these beginning steps. It's interesting that you're bringing up both Ericsson and Volkswagen, um, not only right after we recorded what has become a very popular uh, Research in Motion Blackberry episode, but also as reporting is coming out that, you know, (laughs) like... Canadian innovators exploring being sold for parts um, and and not receiving those major financial commitments. But I even want to just connect. So 
yes, to your credit, this federal government is, is really good at making an announcement and having a dollar figure attached to it. Is it the lack of a cohesive strategy that is then um, having them succumb to a consistent cadence of updates or iteration on this stuff? You know, I don't know if we want to go over um, some of the specific programs that we're talking about, but, uh, you know, there's the uh, proposed shred review that was in uh, last year's budget that we're still waiting on. We could just run our Charles, our, our senior st uh, staff writers feature again about what yeah. that shred review will accomplish because it hasn't happened yet. You have the, um, well, the newly named, crap, what is the new name? The Canadian, Canadian Innovation Advantage Corporation. Corporation. I know open banking has been an ongoing conversation. Yeah. Like, are these, are these files suffering because of lack of cohesive strategy or is it this lack of strategy that then leads to attention? I, I just, this is where we really rely upon you to kind of pull back the hood on some of the machinations of like how government happens. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, understanding the inner workings of where the political class is at in terms of understanding their perspective. I, I, I think there's some real questions we have to ask and we really need to, you know, get some answers. So, you know, we talk about the government spending billions of dollars on this sort of job strategy and this, you know, basic research strategy. But, you know, where are we at as a country, right? We've got unemployment at basically historically low levels, right? So we don't need sort of uh, job creation in sort of the traditional sense of branch plant economics, which weirdly is actually just a Canadian phenomenon. We're the only country that thinks that this is actual um, economic development policy that, that leads to an industrial strategy. Um, so we've got record low unemployment, but then we have this other weird thing happening where our actual wages are declining um, and we're actually falling behind the Americans. You know, Canadians are now 25% uh, less wealthy than their American counterparts in terms of uh, real GDP. And it's not just because the Americans are big, like we're also now behind Denmark um, by about 22%. So what we're actually sort of seeing is this um, sort of weird phenomenon where we're more employed than we ever have been, but we're less uh, productive. And so I think when we think about all of these strategies and how we actually build wealth and prosperity, because that's really the game that the government should be in, right? How do we make sure that each of us are actually earning more money so we can work less and have better health care and better education and all the things that we kind of want on sort of, you know, the, the happiness index that, you know, that's out there. And so, you know, when we look at sort of this government um, approach, I think it's really, um, it's, it's detached and it's not cohesive. And I think that that's from a number of reasons. I think it's um, a government that doesn't necessarily know how to set priorities in the innovation economy. So I think there's a political class um, issue. And, and I don't think that that's actually necessarily just left or right. I don't think that's just liberal uh, or conservative. I think it, it's both parties. We haven't seen the conservatives be critical of, of the government on some of these large spend initiatives, because again, it falls under that job strategy. So I think, I think coherently kind of, critical, maybe. Yeah, yeah, fair, fine, maybe coherently uh, critical. And so I think there's there's that issue that we're dealing with as a nation. And then I think from a bureaucracy, civil servants perspective, I think we've had an atrophy, right? I mean, how much money have we kind of relied on for consultancies and some of this sort of deeper work? And the sort of shreds of green lights or, or, or positive things that we've seen over the last number of years under the liberal government, so in a positive step on immigration, you know, we've seen the creation of the Innovation Asset Collective. We've seen some reforms around things like IRAP and tying that to uh, IP and some of those rules. Like, like they're a little bit there, but it's not sort of enough of a percolation. And so when you see these sort of tremendous amounts of money being spent on a job strategy, you're kind of left to wonder, like, OK, maybe they just don't get the plot. Like they don't actually get how to kind of create it. So um, I think it's kind of a two step. I think it's a political class issue. And I think it's, it's, it's a, a bureaucracy that necessarily doesn't know how to, how to actually create some of these more complex uh, challenges. So we're, or, we're or outsourcing our own innovation policy then. And that's, what's leading to like, do you, do you think this would be more, um, I, I guess more quickly forwarded if there was some, some greater internal, uh, ownership on some of these files is like, so in, in one hand, we're a branch plan economy and in the other hand, we're outsourcing our innovation policy to, um, you know, like we're still waiting for um, Innovation Corporation leader. We have a seconded lead for open banking. 
that will be gone by September, no matter what's done. I don't really know <laughs> who or what is being waited for for the shred review. Like, do you, is, are we just actually missing a implementation layer in this stuff? So I think you know part of it is um, just looking at the political class, right? Like they, they're kind of the you know the ones that really give the direction to the bureaucracy on, on where to begin to kind of focus their energies and sort of how to move things through it. And I just think if you look at, at even the last four months of the prime minister's speeches, whether it be speaking at, you know, a, a scaling technology company, and then you look at him speaking at the Eurasia group uh, at the Canada US summit, and they're incompatible. I mean, it, it's sort of like if you had a friend, uh, and he was behaving that way, you'd kind of be like, hey, dude, like, what's going on? Like, you okay, man? Like, you know, do you need to talk to someone? Because it because it because it is it is a flickering back uh, and forth so quickly that that doesn't lead to any kind of cohesive strategy. So I think the political class is kind of part of it. Um, and then from from a bureaucracy point, you know, I think some of these things are really, really hard. They take time. Um, and to kind of get them moving in the right direction um, uh, does require folks who have been there, you know, uh, for extended periods of time. I love Danny Bresnitz, um, you know, but he was only in the government for a year, right? It was sort of that that term to kind of go and set it up. And so, but he wasn't he, even in the government. He was he was the government's point man who worked outside from a a, a, a what seemed to be like a really cold U of T office, um, providing thoughtful ideas, and then and then he's gone. And uh, I think probably the strongest recommendation that provided as to what happens next actually happened on our podcast with him. Uh, <laughs> where he kind of laid out yeah. the the candidate hiring list for the yeah. leader of that major new corporation. On the CIC, you know, um, you know, we put forward a list of names of folks that we think could sit on the board and, and uh, potentially could be a CEO. Um, and these are folks coming from, you know, our own, our own ecosystem and folks that have led, you know, companies and done interesting things. Um, you know, positively, I, I do have, uh, you know, a couple of meetings next week in Ottawa with the folks that are leading that hiring process. So we'll see what comes of it. Um, and as you know, we've kind of stated in, in, in media in the past, whoever leads this will have a real ability to make decisions and be able to sort of be the, um, you know, the, the ringleader or, or, you know, um, uh, grand marshal in terms of, you know, figuring out what this, what this new CIC actually leads to. So grand marshal, man, grand that, Mar that yeah. If that if that title sticks, then we will definitely have you back on the pod. You should be running the organization. <laughs> As point. the Grand Marshal. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think we've set the broad thematic yeah. component here that allows us to now attack the <laughs> unlimited number of questions that we have. Um, you know, Rob, in the spirit of that um playing that Vanna White role of that Jeopardy board. I'm going to allow you to just choose wherever you want to go here, man. So very uh, quickly, very, just very quickly, you're mixing both Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. Just yeah, very, that's the Beta Get podcast. That's, we, don't that's want, a, we don't want to get sued. I mean, this okay. is Merv this Griffin, is a, the this ghost is of Merv Griffin. This is a generative AI uh, yeah. Yeah. option where we've just yeah. extracted the IP from two different things, mushed it together, and then yeah. suddenly we're, yeah. um, with, with a bit of a Drake beat, uh, completely inoculated from all legal threats, right? That's just all generative AI is. We just have a great data set. So why don't we why don't we go down the Can Canadian Innovation Corp since you brought it up and like one yeah. of the questions from from a, a, a venture capitalist Matthew Roberts, I believe is his name, uh, asked. He's been uh, making recommendations for uh, new government leadership. You know, if you read his newsletter, he's, he's active. Um, he kind of, he was wondering what is good and bad about the CIC. Uh, and what would you like to see in, well, there's a whole bunch of questions here, but let's start with the, what do you think, uh, what are the goods and bads about the CIC? And do you have an idea of who you think should lead it? Yeah. So on who I think I sh should lead it, um, I'm going to give you 10 people. No, I'm not going to give you names. Um, that's, <laughs> Come on, that's, man. That's, I know, Don't pull a president. Give us a yeah. name. Yeah. yeah. Some grand marshal should, uh, should definitely do it. No, I think on that front, um, Look, I think it's someone who, you know, has a track record of actually, uh, you know, building a scaling technology company, someone who understands how things like IP and data work, um, someone who's obviously collaborative. I mean, you know, List is is someone who understands the 21st century economy and what it means um, and helps establish and create um, an agency that um, is able to make um, and support winners that are existing in the space are, is able to help maybe even facilitate or create new institutions that need need to be created um and you're like oh what does that mean you know 
when Canada built the railroad in order to sort of populate and, and create wealth, we had to build things like, uh, you know, co-ops. We had to build the wheat board. We had to build these new institutions that have kind of never existed. And we need to do that in the innovation economy, right? We need to figure out, okay, do we need to come up with some IP collectives? Do we need to come up with some you know, data collectives? Like, what are the tools that we'll need in this new agency to actually help companies scale? Because we don't have unlimited capital. We don't have the same uh, military industrial complex as the Americans, which can help spin off companies. So we got to get a bit smart. We got to get a bit creative. And so whoever is in that role, whether it be the board or the CEO, they have to be someone who has that kind of dynamism to know what's kind of needed. So I think that's kind of where I would sort of put that and kind of leave it. I think on the... Does it have to be a Canadian? Um, Should no. it be? No, I don't think it has to be. I mean... No, I don't think it has to be. I don't think it has to be Canadian. I mean, the probably having an understanding and a knowledge of of the um, you know the hiccups, the bugaboos that is us as a country. Like, yeah, sure, but um, like the you know, I think it would be interesting if the board had folks that were not necessarily Canadian, right? I mean, someone providing a bit of a different perspective. And you know, given where we started this whole episode, and juxtaposing that with, I don't want to call it the bad, but what would you say the challenges would be then? Uh, because I feel like they're not unrelated. Yeah. So look, this is a new, um, you know, a new agency that's basically going to be stood up and mm -hmm. we've seen the government struggle with building successful uh, strategies and, and, and new agencies, right? I mean, we've seen super clusters, you know, be downgraded to just clusters um, and really, you know, they've struggled to commercialize IP and um, so, I, so I think there's that. There's the actual, like, do we have the capacity and the understanding of how to get there? And if it's the same usual suspects that are running some of these um, uh, incubators and accelerators are moved over just into CIC, I think that, you know, it'll be a recipe for, for more of the same. I think the other thing is also is that um, NRC will be relinquishing uh, IRAP. And so IRAP is a program that a lot of uh, startups and scale-ups and your listeners are probably aware of. That's going to move under under a CIC, and you know how is that transition going to occur? Um, you know, there's really smart and talented people that work within within the IREP program, and you know, will they be able to retain them? And a lot of those people actually have subject uh, matter expertise, which is important for this organization, I think, to be successful, giving it sort of like a Fraunhofer institution esque feel. Um, and so that's the question: like, okay, how does the, how does that work? You know, how does Ian Stewart and, and David Lisk deal with with that moving over, or do they move over with it? Those are uh, president and vice president of, uh, uh, I, of NRC. I also am excited because we started with like modern technology, then we went to Nokia and Ericsson, and then you talked about railroads. So I'm not sure how far <laughs> back in Canadian history we're going to go, but I'm kind of excited for the next yeah. question. We can we can definitely talk about the St. Lawrence Seaway if that yes. if that's on <laughs> anyone's locks, uh, locks. yeah. There list. are lessons everywhere, yeah. but I, I guess with that, what, what um, cause you're, you're outlining some, the, some of the conditions and requirements for such an organization to be successful, how it can provide benefits. And then maybe some of the sticking points, what level of confidence you have in not necessarily this government, but in, in Canadian bureaucracy to create a new crown corp like this, that is fundamentally responsible for being nimble and responsive to these issues like that's part of the man other than doling out the irap that's part of the mandate here like yeah where, i mean where would you rate that on a like a out of 10 confidence level so i've been cautiously optimistic for seven years um <laughs> and i continue to be cautiously optimistic look we can do great things in this country and we can move quickly when it's required and some of the successes i would say that we've had from a public policy perspective have been things like unlocking the oil sands, right? You know, a massive government investment, uh, you know, new institutions created and a real success and a win there. Um, that's kind of a, you know, one just sort of off the top of the head. But there's 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 other ways in which we've created, you know, um, successful organizations that have led to, to, to really positive outcomes. I mean, look at even just the way that our, our, our pension system is, stru is structured, right? We've got really strong pensions in this country and that's through, a combination of public policy, you know, um, uh, actual um, uh, competency and, and expertise. So I think that there's definitely an opportunity for us to get this right. Um, it's just, um, you know, getting getting people that are have the skill and the knowledge into into some of those roles. OK, um, I think 
the the policy word was um, utilized here. So I like, man, if someone's playing a drinking game for this, boy, howdy, know yeah. that we record for like at least an hour. But that that makes me <laughs> want to ask, like, you know, moving on um, to things, gauging your level of cautious optimism. This question comes from uh, Graham Moffat. He's on the board of OCI. He's a senior fellow at the Monk School. Um, he's got some fire <laughs> tweets. Uh, <laughs> that's all I'll yeah, say. But- but they delete after a while. So like they his do, spi- they do his, delete after a while. His we need to start is- screen capping instead of just embedding them. But that's just the yeah. nature of all Twitter, isn't it? At this point, yeah, sadly. Ephemeral. But yeah. th- this is Graham's question. By all accounts, Shred is so badly captured and so unproductive that many have argued convincingly. <laughs> I think is he referring to himself? <laughs> uh, it should be scrapped and replaced. <laughs> Ben, is there a baby in that rancid bath water? What parts of Shred would you kill if you were going to save it? And if you want to give maybe, I don't know what historical analogy, if you just want to talk through for our listeners yeah. exactly what function Shred provides, because I know this is where the tension is of like, there are uh, companies probably in your portfolio through CCI and other startups that we know that that receive dramatic benefit from Shred. And then there's every other company company that utilizes this program um for unknown gains um you want to maybe talk through that tension and then respond to graham's question of babies in rancid bathwater verbatim yeah. that was verbatim for the record that was, <laughs> yeah, 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 verbatim. no not, no uh, color added yeah we might have been trying to get graham on the podcast for a while <laughs> and does he not come he's just he's like no there's probably other people you can talk to who are smarter than me or oh, he, he like problem is, the problem is he probably doesn't have signal that far north um he lives like i think he actually lives in quebec now um like he literally lives on that border hi graham if you're listening he just lives um, in my dms to be honest that's all <laughs> look i think shred is a massive program um it actually is um the one you know kind of big lever if you were to get right you could really create some some kind of amazing you know change so Shred kind of oscillates between being like a 3.5, 3.8 billion dollar a year program that the government spends on uh, on uh, research and development, and and um, it goes to close to eighteen thousand companies. And we've been critical uh, of it for lots of reasons. One, it hasn't been updated in like decades, um, and it needs to be modernized uh, because part of the kind of perversion of Shred is that you get companies trying to figure out how they can kind of contort themselves into receiving shred dollars. And that leads to, um, you know, roughly 20% of shred dollars going to consultants to try and help companies figure out how to kind of um, bend and curve their way into it. So, you know, one point there, let's make this program a lot simpler, a lot easier. How can we cut down on, my apologies for saying this, the Deloitte's of the world, uh, getting a lot of a lot of shred dollars. I know me just uh, going after everyone right now. Um, but, I've never but worked make- there. Yeah, how do you make it easier? How do you make it easier? I never um, worked for KPMG. So, <laughs> so um, you know, that's one. That's kind of one area where I think, like, let's let's find some efficiencies there because that that potentially could unlock hundreds of millions of dollars a year. The other thing is also Shred doesn't include um, filing for IP. So we go as a country and we spend all this money on this like really great you know research and development and all all of this you know wonderful stuff, but then we don't actually help companies protect it. And so, you know, one of the things that we've really called for is why don't you allow the filing of IP to be included in it to actually protect the investments that you're actually making. Mm -hmm. And then kind of the last piece that I'll, that I'll I'll kind of raise, um, and this is, you know, kind of maybe the, the most kind of saucy or, or, or explosive is of this kind of 3.5, $3.7 billion a year program. It's been kind of reported and it's hard to get this information because there's freedom of information requests that are denied and it's considered, you know, trade secrets. But wait, yours uh, are denied too? Yeah, sometimes now and again. And so um, of that, you know, 18,000 companies that roughly are accessing Shred and, you know, that number goes up and down. Apparently 20 companies, um, 20 companies ish receive about 50 percent of it. Um, so that means that there's about 20 companies receiving between 1.5 and $1.8 billion a year. Um, and they are Canadian kind of in name only. They are potentially, you know, branch plant, uh, companies. And you kind of know the usual suspects that are potentially receiving that money. And so I think that's the kind of thing where we've got to really figure out, okay, 
if that's the case, if, if that much money is actually going to support the research and development of foreign firms when unemployment is essentially 0%, what are we doing here? Um, and that's kind of the big thing I think with Shred is like, it needs to be reformed. Um, but we also need to reform who that money is going to and what its ultimate goals and desires are. Um, everyone have a drink because I'm about to use the word policy. Um, have a drink um, because public policy needs to actually update and be iterative. If you get stuck in you know 1980s or 70s um, when when Shred was created, you're not you're not capturing where the economy has kind of moved. So this policy needs to be uh, this this program needs to be updated. It needs to be. Um, reimagined. And I think CCI put out, gosh, timelines are all a blur. But uh, I think about a year ago, maybe a year, year and a half ago, we put out kind of our, our sort of, you know, seven recommendations or our seven things that we thought, as they begin the consultation period, um, here's some things to consider. Uh, the consultation period hasn't begun, though. Um, the government has just sort of uh, sat on it. So that was two budgets ago, Ben, when you guys was put it that two? out. That was before was it two budgets ago. Oh. Because I think I think when this was the, I think because uh you know not to give CCI too much credit here. Um but you, you often put out recommendations prior to decisions being made so you can inform the policy drink. Um <laughs> and uh. we we know that that tread review is announcement of last year's budget leading us to last summer question the efficacy of another review of, um, again, a, a program that is it either badly need of it or needs to be just dumped down the drain, depending upon uh, who you're speaking to. Uh, I, I still don't necessarily understand why that's not moving forward, but I want to I want to anchor in on your answer to Graham's question. So you there is yeah. obviously there is baby. There is a baby in the bathwater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what you're trying to kill here isn't the baby. It's no. the hands in the cookie jar that shouldn't be there. Yeah. Or maybe don't reflect a modern sense of industry in in twenty twenty three. Is that correct? Yeah, hundred percent. Like I think there is there is some some um, some positive aspects of it. And look, some good firms do receive money, right? It's not all doom and gloom. But if you're talking about how are we making sure that that taxpayer money is being spent uh, properly and 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 um, we're getting a proper return on investment, I don't think that that's what's happening right now. And I think there's ways that we can reform this program to lead to better outcomes. And that's, that's kind of why we're all here, right? Policy. I'm yeah. here for the drinking games. Yeah. Policy. My friends, let's cut to the chase. You're a founder, an entrepreneur. You're hungry, you're fast, you're agile, and you need a legal eagle that matches your pace. The answer, this episode's sponsor, Good Lawyer. Now, this isn't your grandpa's law firm. Good Lawyer is the trusted legal partner of thousands of businesses nationwide, boasting fixed fee legal projects and their revolutionary fractional general counsel. And look, I'm no lawyer. I can't tell you what tort law means, only that it sounds delicious. But when Baedeket found itself in a labyrinth of legalities, Good Lawyer stepped in, delivering results that were as efficient as they were cost effective. Plus, Good Lawyer's fractional general counsel isn't just versed in the law, they become versed in your business. They stand in the trenches with you, offering practical legal advice that fuels your momentum. So visit goodlawyer.ca today to see for yourself and tell them that Beta Kit sent you. All right, Rob, you, is there another, um, is yeah. there another program here that our, our listeners and now viewers for this video podcast might be uh, hot to trot about? I also had my hair done uh, for the show, uh, just so everyone knew that. Um, anyway, so yeah, no, I, I was, I, I think we'll take, let's do this. Let's take Nicole's question. And then I want to weave that into something we chatted with Senator Deakin and Ray made it on a couple episodes ago. So Nicole Jansen, I hope I got it right. Uh, co-CEO of Alta ML was wondering, there seems to be mounting criticism around the artificial intelligence and data act, right? When the AI is in the hot topic in the news. What should the government's role in AI regulation be? That was her question. Uh, and I kind of like I'd let that stand alone, but I want to follow up with the uh, mm. speed of iteration of that legislation. So, you know, this is the kind of the ADA um, framework, right? And a, a bunch of people, a bunch of people, uh, a lot of predominant AI experts, sorry, better way to put it that way. 
um, you know, signed a letter. There are still a bunch of people. You're, you're yeah, good. there are a bunch of people, but but people that are very much sort of invested in the AI space signed a letter, basically asking the government to you know kind of expedite uh, ADA. We didn't sign the letter um, as an organization. Some of our member companies did, um, um, and some of our member companies did it. And really, the the kind of the aim of ADA is for the government to be able to make uh, determinations and regulations around high impact. AI systems and also um, outputs that potentially could be biased. And the the way that it's written is, is it, it's super it's super open ended. It's super opaque. Mm-hmm. Like it, it it doesn't kind of ground itself in anything. And that I think is um, not something that we could kind of support just sort of uh, freely because it didn't actually have a grounding in what it actually would lead to. It would allow the government to really make some some big decisions without kind of consulting industry. And so I think to kind of pull back a little bit to kind of Nicole's, you know, kind of comment, you know, where should Canada be and and how should our government be really approaching it? And I think um, we're all kind of having this existential moment. Um, literally the father of, of AI or the grandfather of AI, whatever you want to call yeah. it, basically, you know, was it two days ago, three days ago, yeah. essentially yeah. was like, yeah, I think my life's work was a mistake. Um, and if I could go back in time, I wouldn't do it. And quit and, Google. He was a and scientist, quit, head of AI in Google and just said, yeah. We're talking, yeah. We're talking about Jeffrey Hinton, Jeffrey Hinton. Uh, yeah. which we'll yeah. obviously link to that story in the show notes has been, um, it's, it's interesting because every um, generative AI story that we cover, but then generative AI intersecting with policy initiatives or, you know, the Italian government banning chat GPT, things like that have been some of our most popular over the last couple of months. But, uh, this, I think this was one that no one really expected such a bold and dramatic move to step away from, from Google to be able to, to criticize not Google, but some of the initiatives that have been built off the back of Jeffrey Hinton's work. I know there's been some other coverage about Joshua Bengio. If you want to, you know, hold to the metaphor, just like lying awake at night, wondering what the future holds, which is like not what we'd necessarily be hoping for, for the people we prop up as the founding fathers of new technological eras. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you know, to kind of pull back to the, to the kind of the question piece there is there is a lot of question even within industry about where, where all of this is leading. And there's kind of three, you know, areas or, or jurisdictions that are leading. It's China, it's the US, and, it, and it's Canada, uh, to some extent. We do have a lot of that sort of foundational um, research. We, we don't have successful AI companies, but we do have some real capacity in terms of um, strong um, uh, strong expertise. And when I mean companies, I just don't mean, I mean global, global companies, right? We've got some smart, great AI technology firms here, but none of them are like the Googles open or the AI. Metas, uh, yeah, or open AI of the world just yet. And so, you know, a role that potentially Canada could play would be almost like the California of a mission standard setting, right? Like, could Canada kind of come out as a jurisdiction and say, look, this is ethical AI, this is the way that we perceive it. And could we be leaders in terms of how AI should be approached? And what you're going to see within companies is they probably will standardize towards kind of the highest level or the... Or the um, the, the, the perspective that leads to uh, uh, economic opportunity. And if you see what's happening in the US, it's kind of fracturing state by state. So each state is beginning to pass certain pieces of, of uh, artificial intelligence policy. You're seeing kind of a breakup a little bit in Europe with obviously what happened in Italy. And so the idea is if Canada were to, you know, really kind of set some ground, ground laying, you know, principles that, um, you know, put us in kind of a higher standard, could we be leaders in that? And I think, that's potentially a place where we should we should consider trying to play. I think it's it's uh, a bit of a risk. It's a bit of us taking kind of a step forward. Um, but all of this is happening so quickly and so iteratively. You know, I think the government could be a bit bold and try try some of this. Well, that's it's so interesting that you say that because first of all, it, the reason California can do that is because all the cards are in California. I don't think we <laughs> we yes. I, we don't control enough of the pie yet. I, I don't think unless there's some aspect of it that we could. But I, I see your point, and this goes back to the reason I brought this up. I want to tie this to the point you just made and the shred point. When we were talking to Senator Deakin and Rain Maida about, I think we were talking about C-17, C-18, stuff like that. The What we're realizing, I think, is this stuff is happening quite quickly. Legislation, by definition and design, is slow. But 
uh, we don't want to be trapped. Like we don't want to be, uh Oh, it's been 10 years. It's social media accidentally rots our brain and our society. Uh, we have an opportunity to do something in, in the medium or short to medium term. Is there a way to create, this is the Rob, Rob Kennedy, a uh, long time listener uh, question. Can we create, uh, is there a way to create an iterative policy framework where we can act on this as a country more quickly than uh, like aspects of it, maybe not the entire framework and the entire bill, but like move more quickly. Can the CIC play a role in this? Like, is there a way for us to do something where we can Rob, have are you control? recommending a CRTC, but for AI? No. Are we just creating <laughs> new government agencies? With the Absolutely. 100% not, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> so you, we want like almost like a, a, a Canadian content um, kind of component. No, I, I, I think what I would say is like, look, I think, you know, you can stand up new institutions that do some of this work and then do some of the, the monitoring, you know, and, 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 um, create that, that framework. Um, but it's going to require, um, it's going to require cycle. standing up. Yeah. But it's yeah. also going to require standing up new, new institutions. And like, okay. candidly, I think some of them are not necessarily, you know, going to work a hundred percent and that's got to be okay too. And they've got to be, you know, quick and iterative. And I mean, they've got to be like industry, which, um, you know, governments, uh, can really struggle with. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of how I would leave that, that piece. Okay. Well, to the tension on both sides here, because, you know, we've, we've had, we had Carol Piovizen uh, on talk about C27 directly, uh, outlining a lot of the criticisms uh, for the ADA component of that bill being, you know, it's very broad and highly punitive. Um, but I want to go into something that Stephen Marsh said on this podcast as well, uh, you know, intellectual writer. He just published a book with the help of some generative AI uh, said on this podcast. It's just like, Anything that we do from a regulatory standpoint will just move the AI work out of Canada somewhere else, to Rob's point of the auto manufacturers. So I'm, I'm wondering, Ben, how you conceive of Canada playing a leader on this stuff, if it's anything other than an open playground for AI activity. Because if it's anything other than that, water is going to find that level in whatever market um, allows for it. Like we saw this with crypto and it's, it's, you know, to the, <laughs> we want to be the Bermuda go back to of, <laughs> yeah, we do, well, AI. um, maybe, um, but to go back to Ross point or just to look closely to California right now, there's a, there's a, a writer's strike happening, uh, for TV and film writers. And it's mostly because there's an industry there, um, that has been interceded by tech giants, whether it's Amazon or Apple or others who are effectively looking to union bust, because they expect generative AI to replace human beings. So like, I, I guess I'm, I'm uh, agreeing with you on one side that this has got to be move at the speed of industry because industry is moving, but I, I'm, I'm wondering, is there, what, what framework can be constructed for something that is fundamentally a black box, but then, um, also if, if we aren't being, um, a fun sandbox for AI companies to play in or, or, or industry to play with AI, all of that work's just going to move somewhere else and they'll still have the researchers here. Yeah. So I think the best way for us to, you know, to be successful, and this is like kind of CCI 101, which is, you know, going to be kind of a lame sauce answer is that industry and government have to work together. So Nicole, who runs, uh, is CEO of Ulta ML, you know, great AI company based out of Edmonton, they got to work with government on figuring out how they move together left, Foot, right foot left foot right foot and the government's got to work with these domestic companies to help them figure out what are the the policies the regulations i think that your comment about potentially the risk of it being sort of the wild wild west and people may just move like but yeah sure that that's maybe a reality on some of these specific areas but we got to try and um you know that's kind of the best that we can do uh so um I think a way for you to try and inoculate as best you can is you actually have regulators working with the good actors, with the folks like Nicole on trying to build their policy. I think one of the things where, you know, crypto kind of went sort of wonky um, and look, Canada had a lot of really great leaders that were in this space is because you basically had regulators being like, we don't understand this. We're just going to do nothing. And that also created a chill as well, where it's like, we don't know the regulatory framework in which we're existing let's all just go somewhere else. So, you know, inaction is also a form of action as well. And so what I would say is, you know, all the kids got to come to the table and we got to figure out how to make it work. Um, and it's not gonna be perfect. It's gonna be messy, but 
you know, this is what happens in, you know, an industrial revolution. Yeah. I want to know what CCI 102 is. That's where the real action happens. You know, the, it's the, the same the point French. Point <laughs> I, and, and to be clear, this isn't necessarily my point. It's Stephen Marsh's point that yeah. I, I concede is probably true. I think uh, Canada's stance on, on cryptocurrency, like imagine if this was a podcast where the, the drinking game word was securities, um, it has been very, very strong, but, uh, <laughs> Again, there's a regulatory component to those types of things that are um, geographically gated, and uh, AI Drake tracks are all over the internet. Like that, there's just th those borders um, aren't there. So I'm wondering, you know, just to follow up and again push you for more and more detail in this policy wonkery. When you're saying that everyone's got to be at the seat, uh, seat of the table, industry and government. What components of our government are you looking to to be at that seat? Like, who are the point people? Like, we 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 know the privacy commissioner is looking into this, but like, that's not the who seat else? of power to who make else? decisions. Yeah. Like, no, look, who 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 leads on this in the government, or what's the collection of individuals that need to lead on this? Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of you know a bit of a, a kind of a trifecta in terms of who kind of plays you know a role in this. So it's it's folks from finance, it's folks from ICED, it's folks from you know uh, PMO. Like it's 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 the sort of the decision makers that kind of pull different levers at different times and, and depending where certain acts fall. And what I would say is that you need like a coordinated effort in order to kind of achieve the outcomes that you want. And on something like. Um, AI regulation from a from a global perspective, right? I mean, like, do we have our trade commissioner or do we have like the international trade uh, minister involved in some of this, you know, to kind of pull maybe an example that's a little bit different, but same is semiconductors, right? Um, and um, one of the things that, that kind of happened, you know, a, a number of months ago is we brought kind of Canada's best semiconductor companies that were headquartered here to Ottawa. And we brought folks around the table who had never actually had conversations that were in government. So we had folks from Foreign Affairs, we had folks from ICED, NRC, all working on semiconductors in their own little silo, but not actually engaging and figuring out, oh, you know, what is the global uh, implication of semiconductors? What is the, um, you know, uh, economic development area of, of semiconductors? And so if you kind of pull back and think about it from an AI perspective, each one of these different um, ministries has kind of a role to play in terms of how certain things are implemented. And so if it's things like immigration policy, because you need more highly skilled workers, if it's things like you need um, specific you know, directives from things like the Competition uh, Bureau and some of those elements, how are they all working together? So it's, it's kind of like you just need more collaboration across some of these areas. And then you need industry to come in and give the perspective of like, actually, if you create this rule, all of us will have to leave because it's becoming too difficult from a regulatory perspective. Let's let's stick on the collaboration kind of framing and go to another example here that is um, similar but different. This is coming from Michael Garrity, CEO of Finance It, and this is this is directly towards open banking, right? Which is another direct intersection between incumbent industry, regulatory bodies, and then Canadian innovators who are not playing at equal levels here. Uh, Michael's question is, there are increasing rumblings in the market that the federal government is looking to um, is going to look to bank owned entities like Simcor to lead the implementation of open banking in Canada. Uh, we've reported on some of this. I think other publications have heard rumblings of this, too. Um, Simcor, they've done a lot of um, sponsored initiatives related to open banking uh, in Canada, if you've been paying attention. Um, so, Michael asks, it could be a fox in the hen house situation. How does... CCI feel about this proposal of a bank owned entity like some core or it's Interac or anyone else kind of, um, again, owning, owning what is supposed to be open pipes for financial innovation. Yeah. I mean, look, I think it, it, it immediately sort of stifles innovation and, you know, here's another file where we've seen the government, um, delay. Um, this was part of their election, um, promise that they would move towards open banking and, for those folks who don't know necessarily what open banking is, you know, it, it, I don't know, it somehow maybe sounds like a little bit risky, but basically what it is, is um, allowing consumers to make their own financial data available and being able to transport it, and use it sort of as they see fit. And I think if, if it's ultimately, you know, a gatekeeper um, and sort of the, the usual suspects that are doing it, 
I don't think that really does lead to the open banking, you know, sort of reality that, that, that we were hoping for. And if you look at something like open banking in the UK, you've actually seen a real benefit to, um, uh, to citizens and to, you know, the average person. And so if it turns out that it's just, um, sort of a reshuffling of what already exists. I don't think that actually is meeting kind of the government's commitment. What, what was it? The Fox in charge of the hen house. Is that, is that how you kind yeah, of worded that one? Yeah. The Fox yeah. in the then, hen house situation. Then, then but, but the, it, like the banks are also the hen house. So it's like, <laughs> what well, I, I don't know where the startups are in that metaphor, but like yeah, they, they, the house, the house <laughs> always wins here. Um, yeah. You know, even just to the point today, I saw a uh, co-host CEO, Daniel Eberhard, posting about the work that they've done over the last two years just to not have transactions fail when they're looking to manage uh, their customers' uh, deposits and transfers um, because there's no system for that. So it's it's data portability on behalf of consumers, but it's it's not necessarily consumer-owned or directed. It's It's facilitated by the services that those consumers might want to use. And Daniel's like, you know, we've worked with our partners – over two years to make this not fail like 50% of the time. But if you look to the States, you have companies like uh, Revolut and others that within six months have the licensing to do this kind of stuff and don't have to jury rig a system. So um, it's, yeah, it's, I guess it's the whole farm that's, that's wired for this. You know, Ben, you noted this is, was an election promise. This has been uh, something where the reports and the requirements were put together by committee that sat on somebody's desk for like three months. Then it was rolled out. They identified the open banking lead, Abraham Takjian. So he started a little bit late into his tenure. They pushed things back. He's done. Um, so this is already behind uh, in terms of when it was supposed to be implemented. But uh, Takjian's tenure ends, I believe, around September. And as we've reported earlier this year, there are still massive concerns that that work is getting done. It seems like all the seats at the table are filled. We've got the lead and the work isn't getting done. Is there any insight that we can derive from that? Is it particular to this process, this sector of industry, why this is happening from a thousand meters up? It seems to be close to what CCI would recommend for other sectors in terms of how you'd want this to come together. We're just not yet seeing the results. So I think when you think about who's around the table, uh, I don't think it's the scaling technology companies. I think it's the continued entrenched interests. And, you know, some make the argument that uh, the banking sector in Canada is actually an extension of the government um, in terms of how uh, yeah, it is protected, how its policies are set up. Um, and, you know, I think I think that you're coming up against real tension between the entrenched interests uh, and the interests of startups that are trying and scale ups that are trying to create new opportunities. So, do we have the right people around the table? Um, you know, is everyone sort of being listened to? And as things kind of begin to in innovate, and you know, we've heard that that Minister Freeland has has also wanted to delay this process as well. You know, there's kind of been you know, a couple of Globe and Mail articles I think about it uh, over the last you know year or so as well. So, I don't know. You know, are are, are people there um, uh, being genuine? I think question mark um, and. Um, is it is it innovators that are actually being let in, or is it um, you know the fox? Are there again, only kind of foxes determining... in the hen house? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Let's pick another uh, spicy one. So, you know, uh, this is from Ravensburg. Rob Ravensburgen, good first name, last name, yeah, two. But I like the first name. Um, his question is: According to the CVCA, the Canadian Venture Capital Association's 2022 20, year in review, the BDC accounted for more than 20 percent of all venture funding in Canada, while other public and parapublic funds make up a similar contribution to the total. Given the uniquely non-economic mandates found in some of these organizations, do you believe the mandates create perverse incentives that may otherwise undermine the productivity and profitability of firms found in the Canadian venture ecosystem, particularly at a time when Canada's productivity games and financial capital formation lag behind other G7 countries? Did you remember that question or do you want me to read Rob, I really so like how you sold that it, one. You really put that question over the top. Yeah. It's basically like BDC good, BDC bad. Is that, is that, is that kind of sufficient or? I guess so. Yeah. Is it, is it a good act? Well, is it, is it incentivized? I, I would assume that Rob Ravensbergen probably listened to the podcast, the AMA podcast that we did previously with one John Ruflo, who I believe is a chair on CCI and was speaking, um, 
pretty articulately about the dangers of having um, the majority of the capital deployed in our ecosystem be government backed or government associated, whether BDC, VCCI, um, things like that. I don't know. Again, this is kind of um, I'm always trying to find ways to to do this counter to like a branch plan economy like the, <laughs> you know, um, American capital can be great if deployed properly, I think kind of leads to this question. But um, I guess maybe, Ben, to simplify, unless we want to parse this sentence by sentence, are you aligned with uh, Mr. Ruflo's take on this? Or uh, how far does CCI play uh, in this sphere when it comes to, from a, like a policy standpoint? Yeah, so uh, I always agree with John. Uh, no, uh, uh, no. So I think on kind of high level thinking about um, capital in the market, like all capital is good capital in terms of um, here in the country, because as we know, firms are struggling to access capital kind of at, at, at all stages. And this is only getting more kind of acutely uh, challenging based off of interest rates, but also based off of, um, I think, just sort of a general quelling or, or quieting uh, of, of the ecosystem uh, because of failures like Silicon Valley Bank, right? We saw that um, uh, impact, you know, w how people are feeling about the space. So um, BDC uh, having capital into the into the ecosystem is good because it is, is capital. Where it becomes problematic is when it begins to squeeze out uh, um, uh, private capital, right? So as a public capital, it, you know, can be good. But, but when we begin to see that squeezing out, that's when I think we have to be considering kind of the, what is kind of the right policy levers that are being used. And what I would say is on something like BDC, you know, some of the, the criticisms that kind of get um, sort of brought forward about it is that it is just like a regular big Canadian bank, that it isn't doing innovative um, investments or as risky investments uh, as potentially some other um, uh, uh types of crown corps in, in, in other in other countries. And so, you know, I think the question is, um, you know, does BDC need to be a bit reimagined in terms of where it's deploying capital? You know, question mark, that that might be a good podcast in, unto itself. Um, but kind of the bottom line is that um, having having them there as a player is important and having that capital there is important. It's when it begins to squeeze out that I think you get the issue, you get the issue. It's weird. just curious as a follow up, and maybe you don't know this off the top of your head, but not accounting America land, uh, are we weirdly disproportionate with this kind of stuff compared to other countries of our size and and shape? Um, I think maybe how it's done is maybe a bit different, right? You know how uh, how different countries you know use to deploy you know investment dollars. Um, I think is a bit you know is a bit different depending on the jurisdiction. The one thing I would say, and this is now a plug for uh, Council Kane Innovators, is oh. I know, right? Uh, is that we heard that there were issues uh, raising capital, um, and that having um, really the forums where, whether it be private offices, VCs, banks, can kind of connect with innovators has has been a bit of a struggle. And so we've we've actually launched our first capital summit, which we're doing on May fifteenth in Toronto. And we're going to be, you know, looking at envelopes of money that are that are sort of on the higher size. This isn't for startups. It is for firms that are looking for kind of 20 million plus. Um, but we're going to begin to try and create some of those relationships. So this is definitely a, a problem. And there is um, uh, challenges currently in the Canadian uh, funding ecosystem, 100 percent. Yeah, I just want to follow up on something not to. Uh, I, I want to give Rob the credit here of of submitting this question and making sure we attack it. But there was some, there was something buried sandwiched in the middle of this where he references non economic mandates found in some organizations like BDC, um, and he's wondering if uh, you believe or CCI believes these mandates create perverse incentives that may otherwise undermine productivity. I don't know if he's using coded language to talk about um, ESG given the fact that, you know, BDC just recently announced like half a billion dollars for investing in women-led ventures, or there's another component here, but assuming, you know, maybe not assuming that he is, but just to make sure that we cross it off. If, if we were to talk about the non-economic mandates of BDC when it comes to ESG considerations, where is CCI with stuff like that? We are, you know, our values and, and, and show me your budget and I'll show me, and I'll show you your values. Right. And so, 
I think that is uh, um, an important piece that, you know, uh, our member companies care about and, 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 and think about, right, is how do you build kind of the society that you want? And so on something like some of these, um, whether it be quotas or standards, you know, have clear um, and defined um, definitions of what you're looking for um, and make sure that, um, you know, all innovators are kind of able to play in this space. I think where you sometimes get into some challenges in kind of the more startup scale up space is, is um, can it be uh, challenging for those companies to meet all of those requirements based off of, uh, 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 of the regulation? And so what I would say is if you're a government that's wanting to begin implementing some of those specific pieces, make sure that you're figuring out ways to support companies to be able to achieve the uh, outcomes that you want, whether that be diversity inclusion, whether that be ESG, um, because just imposing mandates, but without helping, you know, smaller firms be able to actualize and, and realize that, you know, you're potentially making it difficult for them to to scale and to grow. Okay, let's let's kind of connect that thread to another question about an entirely different sector in terms of like supports beyond the initial commitment. And I think we're coming to a, a rapid close here because, my God, we've got, actually gotten through most of the questions here. You savages for submitting these. Um this is coming from uh, Pratish Gawand. He's the CEO of uh, Ardra Inc. Uh, this is a question. We use biotechnology to make sustainable food ingredients. I would like to submit the following question for the AMA. Thank you, Pratish. Um, the U.S. government has set bold goals to boost their uh, bioeconomy along with $2 billion in support. Uh, Canada's biomanufacturing capabilities are close to non-existent and the Canadian companies innovating in this sector are forced to outsource R&D and manufacturing to other countries. This is causing us to slow down our innovation and more importantly, jeopardizes our intellectual property. Ooh, what's our other drinking word? Um, are you aware of any specific steps being taken by the Canadian government to support innovation and biomanufacturing within our country? Knowing that this is a little bit outside of the CCI mandate, I wanted to ask it, not only because this is a very interesting company that I've had a chance to talk to, they've noted how they had to go to Europe to find um, the manufacturing support, didn't turn out, their, um, the, the company they were working with in Europe actually went bankrupt just before they were to deliver uh, on the work. So they're now working with China, which causes um, other IP tariff issues um, I believe they've gotten some I said support, even though they're not doing the work. It's, it's, it's a bit of a mess. Um, knowing that you're not necessarily focused on the bioeconomy at CCI, can you apply a bit of a CCI lens here in terms of where you think the support should be or may any, you know, uh, whispers you're hearing, uh, amongst the halls of government that might give, uh, Pratish some good news here. Yeah. So, you know, I think that this is, this sector, the, you know, the bio space is kind of similar to kind of all the other areas we've talked about, right? Government, I think, committed $2.2 billion in 2021 budget to the, to the space uh, to helping implement biomanufacturing and life sciences. You know, I think some of that money has been deployed uh, to some, you know, to some, some member companies, a few organizations that I'm kind of aware of. But again, it's one of those things where government's got money. Um, they, you know, deploy it to a couple of firms, but there's no kind of cohesive strategy about uh, some of the other elements that are really required, not only just to generate the IP, but then to retain it and commercialize it. So I think that this is kind of a rinse and repeat of this government's failures where we got money, but we don't got a strategy. And I think that that's what we're seeing um, play out probably in, in biomanufacturing uh, as well. Okay. Way to round it back to the beginning because we're at the end. Yeah. Uh, so uh, here's a, here's an easy one. If you were the, <laughs> <laughs> in, in seven words or less, that's just me adding it. If you were the minister of industry, science and innovation, what would you want to see in your mandate letter? And what would you, your five-year plan be? Okay. That's coming uh, this from, is from uh, yeah. Yeah. Or from Guy Levesque, Guy Levesque. the associate vice president of innovation partnerships and entrepreneurship at uh, university of Ottawa. Also the chair of the Canada North business association board. Interesting. Um, Very pointed question. I've met him actually at uh, at a uh, government announcement. Um, oh, that's cool. So what did he? What I, did you say to him that made him ask you this question? Just <laughs> <laughs> I'm clear. I'm clear. No, look. I think. Okay. So first things first. Um, I would get rid of the name. Uh, I would just want to be called <laughs> the. Uh, uh, go back to being Industry Canada. I think let's go back to basics. And I think what I would want to see in that mandate letter is. Um, 
really kind of the, the defining piece is um, go and build industrial policy that leads to um, domestic sovereignty in certain areas. Like let's actually build public policy and institutions that allow us to generate IP, retain IP and commercialize IP. And then what I would do is I would filter all government spend through that lens um, in the innovation space or in the industrial policy space and determining, you know, we know our inputs, what are our outputs uh, and begin to measure it. And I think if you were to sort of begin to reorientate the, the, the money component, which the government is quite good at doing as we've kind of communicated, but then figure out what are the other institutional pieces that you need to create to protect IP. Uh, and then to commercialize it, I think would be kind of a winning a winning strategy. Um, and that's kind of what I would want to see in that mandate letter. And that then plugs into all the other things that we've just talked about. It plugs into shred, right? Are we spending money to support foreign companies' ability to generate IP? So is that actual IP generation for Canada or is that for, uh, you know, Volkswagen or other jurisdictions? Is it um, playing into the AI strategy, right? Are we generating IP? Cool. That did generate IP. But it turns out we had no way of actually retaining it. All of it ultimately left. And we didn't end up commercializing any of it. And I think if you go down the line looking at it through that lens, like that would definitely take you five years. Um, but I think if you did it through that lens, you would get to the end of that term as an innovation minister or the, the new uh, industry minister or the old industry minister, I guess. And what you would see, I think, is a very different landscape of Canada having a robust industrial policy that ultimately is actually creating productivity. Um, and not just leading to sort of a sort of weak uh, job strategy um, in an unemployment area that's already at, you know, basically zero percent. So your five year plan would be having a five year plan yeah. fundamentally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So you uh, you ended off about as hot as you came in, Ben, which we greatly appreciate. It's why mm -hmm. we enjoy having you on the podcast. I'm wondering how you feel about this um I set it up at the beginning as a firing squad of questions. It's certainly a gauntlet noting that, you know, every time we do an AMA, we get maybe one or two innovation policy questions because, you know, uh, we attract a certain set of nerds mm -hmm. while there are, I believe a couple CCI companies who submitted questions in here. There's a pretty broad swath of people that seem interested in this at this point in time. Are there any broad takeaway from what you've been asked today that maybe, I don't know, were you were surprised by or is just, again, hammering things home? I'm just wondering how you feel after we just did a one hour long speed round of innovation policy questions for you. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the kind of the takeaway is people are wanting to engage in this and people realize that this stuff matters. And I think there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty that um, I think all of us are facing, whether... You know, that'd be just sort of like the you know average citizen or people who are actually involved in the space. And I think us figuring out how we can actually connect with our governments and connect with our ability to make decisions about, you know, the society and the democracy that we live in, I think is is um, critical. And, and I, you know, I kind of hope as we begin to try and solve some of these bigger problems, you know, folks that actually submitted questions and folks that are listening begin to kind of do some of the engagement, because ultimately it's up to us to determine you know, the future that we want, as kind of corny as that sounds. But it really is um, about engagement, involvement, and participation. Ladies and I gentlemen, the uh, Minister of Industry, Benjamin <laughs> Bergen. Yeah, long may he reign. Yeah. What was the other, so you're, you're the Minister of Industry, and then what was the other title that we gave you earlier on? A Grand Marshal. GM. Grand yeah. Marshal. Yes, Grand Marshal. Wow. Yeah. It's such a is that the, like with the podcast. baton in the twirling parade kind of Grand Marshal? Yeah. That, no. Yeah. yeah, always twirling towards innovation. Uh, yeah. Ben, thank you so much for doing this. I hope it was it was fun for you. I know a lot of people are going to listen to this based upon who submitted questions, and I think they got um, some some decently thorough answers from you, as well as a, a few spicy takes. So that is much appreciated. If your question wasn't asked and answered, that's okay. We do an AMA every month. Um, if you have other questions that you would like to have asked, maybe we won't. Maybe we will actually do one just purely on IP. Who knows where this is going to go? Maybe we'll just do a full hour on shred and just really figure out how many babies are in that bathwater. There's only one way this happens. You've got to email us podcast at beta kit, submit your questions, 
And then we'll see you in one month's time with a new special guest, which we will uh, hold their feet to the fire to make sure your questions get answered. Uh, until then, Katie, get out. <laughs>